the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Those of us who have been around for a while are well aware of human suffering in body and soul. This is often very close to us when it does not affect us directly. The older you get, the more you see of it and experience it. All the excitement, stress, and battles of life to finally end up in that condition and eventually dead. At first look, it just doesn't make sense. The sad father of our Gospel reading is desperate about his poor epileptic boy. From the other Gospels, we learn that it's his only son. The demon makes him fall in the fire and the water, and he only survives because of the protection of his parents. It might have been that the unfortunate father kneels before Jesus in desperation, and yet with faith. It might have been a very small faith, but it was faith. And it was a faith, faith big enough to drive him by his love to go to Jesus and turn to him and ask him for healing. He had first gone to the nine, to nine of the apostles, while the other three, Peter, James, and John, were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. The nine could not heal the boy. Jesus tells them that they could not heal him because of their lack of faith. It's kind of impressive to hear Jesus tell the nine apostles that they lacked faith. We see Jesus heal the boy by his divine power, this divine power that was manifested on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, last week we had that reading, as you know. Only prayer, faith, and fasting could cast away the demon and sickness from this poor boy, says Jesus. Prayer, faith, and fasting together will do miracles and could even cure this demonic, tormented, epileptic boy. Why was this poor boy so sick and tormented? It's easy for us to ask the same question about the people we love and are sick and tormented or worst have been robbed away from the Lord and His Church by the devil. Why do they suffer from this illness? He always was a good dad, she was always a good mom, a church goer, and so on. Why such an aggressive and violent cancer, this degenerative sickness? Why so young to be terminally sick? We see it all the time. Why such a difficult mental illness, which is plaguing many Canadians today? What have I done wrong? We often feel like the father of our Gospel reading, desperate, in need of healing, pleading with Jesus to heal. While our spiritually or physically sick loved ones are still alive, they are left here for us to care for them. To care for them like this father cared for his boy. They are there for us to learn to love, learn to love, and for us to learn to pray, and yes, Jesus says, fast. We all get sick and die. Our souls are sick with sin and captive of many passions, so we need to care for one another by our love and also by our prayers. We often would only care for ourselves and to satisfy the craving of our passions. We are called to be like Christ by caring for others, even by healing them through our prayers and fasting. We are, of course, to care for our own salvation before we can even begin to care for others. The first step is to detach ourselves from the pleasures of the body, which is the, the big challenge, as this, the pleasures of the body are hugely celebrated in our culture. As you might know, the passions of the body are gluttony and lust, and not too far is the love of money. These sinful passions, as well as many self-serving emotions, are celebrated and glorified in the world we live in. We fall easily for them. But the Lord, 
gave us medicine. Medicine to detach us from the bodily and passing pleasures of this life. It's prayer, faith, and fasting. Let's start with the easiest medicine of the tree. Believe it or not, the easiest of the tree is fasting. Even unbelievers practice fasting such as intermittent fasting to lose weight or clean the system or just, you know, to look good because they want to be slim. Obviously, this is not the fasting our Lord Jesus is telling us to practice. Why then is the Lord telling us to fast? I know many of us do not fast much, if at all. And sometimes we fast and we're not even sure why or we just mindlessly follow rules or even overeat of the allowed fasting foods. That's, I do that sometimes. Normal, normal eating is actually eating just what we need. For the fasting periods, it's ideal to even eat a little less than we need. Fasting can include more than food. We can fast by abstinence from all sorts of passing pleasures of the body and by fasting emotions even, such as entertainment and activities that please us. By fasting we save time and money so we can dedicate more time to prayer and materially bless others such as the poor. Thus, our good tradition of increasing almsgiving during fasting days and seasons. But more importantly, the most important about fasting is that we realize how much we are addicted to the passing pleasures of this life. We need to make heavenly and eternal things our lasting treasure and joy. Yes, joy. There is joy in the heavenly things. The impact of fasting on our soul should be to detach us from these pleasures, to see them as mere passing pleasures, as mere passing, yes, blessings, but passing blessings. This can only be attained when faith and prayer are closely linked with fasting. If we are always worried about enjoying the pleasures of life, we lose sight of the heavenly and lasting joys of growing in our union with Christ. We lose sight of the needs of others and only think of, fulfill of fulfilling our desires. And this again is very celebrated in, in our culture. <coughs> Fasting breaks all that into pieces and produces humility in us. Prayer and faith are inseparable from fasting. Fasting could harm you if it is not accompanied with prayer and faith. It could become a Pharisee in practice and could even make you more irritable and less loving and less spiritual. Do you have a rule of prayer? A series of prayer you say in the morning and in the evening and even also at noon? If not, Ask one of our clergy or another Orthodox Christians who prays to help you establish one. Then just do it faithfully. That's a good start to prayer. There's also good suggestions on the Archdiocese website. Jesus and St. Paul tells us to pray always. So in our tradition, we have the Jesus prayer and the prayer rope. Time does not allow me to explain the Jesus prayer, that's a sermon by itself, but, by start, but, but start doing it also. Even if it's only 33 times a day, while truly focusing on Jesus when you are praying, and also maybe including people you love and know that are in need in your prayer as you're doing the Jesus prayer. We are blessed that also at this cathedral with many scheduled prayer services. Of course, we're busy with life and we can't attend them all, but there's many that we could attend. And so attending those and even singing along at those will help you build your life of prayer. 
In your prayers, do not forget others. Make a list and battle for others in your prayers. This will also detach you from yourself and focus you on others. Once we are working on our own salvation and start experiencing in prayer the presence and joy of our communion with God, we see the vanity of the passing glories and pleasures of this earthly life. Somehow, in a miraculous way, our hearts are changed by the Holy Spirit. We start caring about what happens to others, just like Christ cares and loves for all people and calls them back to Him. Again, we're talking about here Theosis, union with God, becoming like Christ, caring for others. Then we can pray with care and love for them. Our detachment from the world and demonic influence by fasting from the passing pleasures and blessings of this world allow us to become true intercessors for others with the saints and the Theotokos. As I said earlier, this begins when we make the kingdom of God our dearest treasure. We must start casting out our own attachment to bodily and fleshly pleasures by fasting before we battle for others against demons by our prayers. So Jesus says that we are to pray with faith. Faith. We just need a small faith to pray in a way that we'll be able to move spiritual mountains. The apostles could not cast out the demon from the boy because, says Jesus, they had no faith. They had a lack of faith. This is the faith that completely trusts Christ and his teachings. This is the faith that believes that he has conquered death by his death and given us new life by his resurrection on the third day. This is the faith that, he, that believes that he is truly the Son of God, true God, made man, all-powerful against death and sickness. As we see in our text, Christ predicted his death and resurrection and did not try to avoid it. He willingly went to the cross to pour his blood for our forgiveness, to free us from the curse of God's law, so that we now can approach him boldly as our loving God and Father. God is for us in Christ, so we can approach him in prayer. He came to visit that with his divine life, so that by faith, in Him, we participate in this divine light of the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the faith that lives by the Spirit. When we live in the Holy Spirit, our communion and journey with Christ becomes the center of our lives and a fountain of joy, peace, and love. For the fruits of the Spirit are, says Paul in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, as opposed to the works of the flesh. The Holy Spirit produces fruit in us. We can taste and experience those fruits as the divine joy and peace that we were created to experience. The works of the flesh give us a distorted and deviant pleasure, but in prayer and faith we are filled with the Spirit and empowered to win our own battles against sin and the demons, and we help others in their battles by our prayers. God grants us himself progress in this through the prayers of the Theotokos and of all the saints. Amen.